Hello folks, Dick Fairburn here. I'm wrapping up a playlist of western hunting topics, primarily dealing with elk because I'm going on an elk hunt in a couple of months in Wyoming. I've covered what kind of load you need, what kind of rifle calibers probably are going to be best for you, how to shoot at long distance, how to factor in the wind and correct for it, and how to shoot high or low angled shots. Uh, those typically are not a problem, but they can be a problem if you have a severe up or down angle at a distance. So I asked my buddy Mark in Wyoming, review all these for me and tell me some things I've left out, some good tips. And in his 40 plus years of elk hunting, he has been in on the killing of truckloads of elk. Okay, he's acted as a, a volunteer guide for a lot of local people as well as being a professional guide for sheep hunting in Alaska for a number of years. So Mark is tough, he knows his way around these big game animals, and he's got a lot of good tips. So here's a tips video of things that I thought of but didn't get in the videos, more importantly things that Mark came up with. And one of those is that if you're going on a horseback hunt, you're going to need to carry your rifle in some kind of saddle scabbard. Now generally the outfitter is going to have a scabbard for you. But there are things you need to take into consideration and probably things you need to tell him about your rifle if you're going to use his scabbard. Here's the one I used for years and years. This is made by Hunter Leather. Uh, you know, very simple, but quality. You can see it's, it's kind of banged up from a lot of rides horseback into, into big country. A couple things I didn't like about it. It's really made backwards. I like to carry a scoped rifle on the left side of the horse. You get on and off the left side of the horse. And when you get off, the rifle should be right there to pull out of that scabbard towards the rear and be ready to get on the game. This has a pull the dot fastener, which is good. Just a simple snap can be popped loose by brushing things. This one is more difficult to, to pop loose because it only come from one angle. The slot is where your bolt goes in and then this traps it in place. In order to carry this on the left side of the, the horse and pull it out the way most guys do, this has to be upside down. The scope has to be down. Now I've never seen the scope down cause a problem. I've never had one knocked out of alignment or, or fail to work perfectly. But ideally this should be made so that it sits scope up with the flap over here. And if you look online you can some places make them in left or right. Leather has become very expensive. Uh, the, the leather ones that I see online are anywhere from $150 to $300 or more because quality leather has become outrageous in the last 10 or 15 years. It's practically worth its weight in gold. The other downside is they, if you're out in a rainstorm or a lot of snow, they can get pretty soaking wet. And that's why I have eventually converted all of my stuff over to stainless rifle actions and barrels and synthetic stocks that the, we the weather's not going to damage them, and more importantly, it's not going to swell that wood up and knock your zero out of, out of whack. Now, this scope will fit in this old style scabbard, as long as they don't have a sling on it. But even just adding that won't let it go in there, and that's because the scopes we use nowadays are so much bigger than the scopes we used 20, 30 years ago. This is not an overly large scope but it will barely fit. If you've seen my other videos on, on the Elk series, my 280 rifle has this same you know, loophole VS6HD, but it's the 3 to 18 with a large objective. There is no way it will go in that kind of saddle scabbard. Other things that are gonna cause you problems, if you think, if you are a person that carries a bipod on your rifle most of the time, it's not gonna fit in a saddle scabbard. If you carry a suppressor, Unless you have a very short barrel, it's probably not going to fit in a saddle scabbard. So think about these things ahead of time. Talk to your outfitter and see what they're using for saddle scabbards and if your rifle is going to fit in with their stuff. Most of the, what I would recommend probably nowadays is a saddle scabbard, and this is not a saddle scabbard. The only difference being it's going to be rigged with straps that are very solidly mounting and it's probably not going to have the carrying handles. This is simply a well padded rifle case and it's made much larger so that even my 280 with that large diameter 
objective lens, big size scope is going to slide in there very easily. None of these have any rigidity, so I'm not concerned about that. Um, and, and when you get on these, if you've ridden horses much, when you have a rifle under one leg, it's going to get uncomfortable. And you're going to have to fiddle with the angle and the placement of this up or down to kind of get it to where it's both comfortable to you and the horse. Okay. It's not a bad idea to buy your own saddle scabbard. And, and these type I've seen on the internet from $75 on up, they're made to handle the larger scopes and they're gonna work well for you. Taking your own saddle scabbard ensures that you're gonna have what you need when you go on that hunt. One other tip, this is one I've seen a number of times. Some guys will leave their sling on there, but they'll leave a loop kind of hanging out the back of this. If it, if the, if it doesn't zip clear up, and you have a loop hanging out loose here, I have seen the loop of that sling hook on tree limbs and in one case jerked the rifle right out. In another case, it didn't get the rifle out, but it did tear the flap off of the saddle scabbard. So make sure if you're gonna have a sling on there that it's tight within and it's not hanging out loose to catch on something. When you, go, when you ride through heavy timber, anything that's in the way, anything that's out there to be caught on something will be caught on something, trust me. All right, so that's, that's one thing, that's one good tip is either take your own saddle scabbard that will fit your scope, your rifle, very well, or discuss this with your outfitter and make sure he's going to provide a scabbard that will fit your rifle. If it doesn't work, the only alternative is to sling this thing across your back while you're up there riding that horse. And as I said, if you're going through any kind of timber, anything sticking up or out is going to bang on every tree limb that you can find. Horses are good at that. Uh, on my moose outfitter, the first horse they gave me liked to try to rub you off on trees. So he would get over as close to the brush as, you, as he could, thinking he's going to get you off of his back. Another thing I will add as a tip, if you've not been on a horseback hunt, if, you've, if you're not a horse rider, decent skill level, then get out and get on a horse. Go to a riding stable, tell them I'm going on a mountain hunt, I want to get on a horse, I want to ride them around a little bit just to get the feel for the motion of the horse. If they have some steep hills, or you know, ride them up, ride them down. See where you got to lean backwards if you're going down? You got to kind of hunch forward to help the horse balance the weight as they go up. So the more experience you can get horseback, it will pay off for you. Another tip from my buddy Mark is to make sure you always carry your scope on the lowest magnification setting. This is a 2 to 12. So what we say is, and I agree, uh, carry it on two. If the, if the animal is out there in a shooting situation and they're out there far enough that you're going to have to get steady and measure distance with a laser or things like that, you will have time to zoom this up to more magnification or maximum magnification if you need to make sure your reticle is going to be accurate for mill radians or, or uh, minutes of angle. Keep it on low, especially if you're hunting in grizzly country. If you need to get off that horse and jerk that rifle out quickly, I don't want this thing at 12 power where I'm going to be lucky to get on the grizzly at all, and if I am, all I'm going to see is a patch of hair. I want this thing down at 2, lowest possible magnification, widest possible view, so that if, if it's a defensive situation, you're going to be ready for that. All right, another tip is to have some spare ammunition readily at hand. Assume you're going to load your rifle magazine up. Some have detachable magazines. If you have an extended detachable magazine, this one doesn't extend by much, but a little. That's another factor. If you're, if you're carrying those 10 round PMAGs in a bolt action rifle, that's going to add quite a bit of, of elevation that needs to go into that saddle scabbard. Okay, but the point is, have, some, have a ready supply of ammunition. This one only holds three of belted magnums. So if I go through three rounds, and I need more because I've wounded that elk. It's carrying a, a leg. I know it's, I broke a shoulder or something like that, but they can run a long ways on three legs. And you need to keep shooting at elk, especially. If you know you've hit that elk, then you stop shooting when it hits the ground or when you no longer have a shot because it's 
over the hill or into the timber. You owe that animal more rounds to try to get it down on the ground as quickly as you can. So that, that's a lesson. If you know you've made a hit, if your spotter sees it, if the, if the elk gives you an indication of a hit, the only elk I've killed was a spike bull, and I was using it with a borrowed rifle because I took a buddy deer hunting that day. I didn't have a rifle with me. And lo and behold, here was an elk way down off the mountain where, where they probably shouldn't have been, but they were. So I took a shot at this spike elk, and the way he had this rifle badly zeroed, it actually went underneath and broke the off hind leg. So when this thing took off running, you can see that the legs swinging broke, okay? All you can do is put more rounds onto that elk and try to get it down the ground as fast as you could. He had a 30-06, there were five rounds in it. I hit it with four of the five rounds as it ran down this steep hill. One of them, you know, I've always heard running away, hold at the, the root of their tail and try to break the spine and roll them. I held there running steep downhill and I rolled it. And, and there was a little bit of snow, this giant cloud of snow as this elk rolled down the mountain, got right back up on three legs and took off just as fast as it had before. If you don't make a great shot on an elk, they can go an awfully long ways. I went through those five rounds. Luckily, he had a sling with a little pouch on it that had three more rounds. That elk got to the bottom of the mountain. We're talking a five or 600 yard shot now with a rifle that's not zero the way it should have been. I held high and got a lucky hit, but only because of those extra three rounds in that pouch was I able to finish the job of putting that elk down. Okay, so if you've got a magazine fed weapon, have a spare magazine readily at hand in a pocket that you can easily get to, slap that in there, throw the bolt, and you've got more ammunition. If you're a top feeder, some guys like to put a stock sleeve on the opposite side. Right-handers, you're gonna put your cheek over here. You can have eight or 10 rounds on here. A lot of shooters like to do that. Makes it a little heavier, uh, but I have some rifles rigged out that way as well. Another way are these folding carriers. This, goes, this will go on your belt. When you Velcro it open, you've got 10 more rounds that will unfold for you. You're not going to war. You shouldn't need a whole lot of rounds, but it's very possible that you may need some follow-on shots. So have some ammunition readily at hand to continue the process of putting that animal down. Another good tip. One of the things I want to add to this tips list, let's say you do not, let's say you have a laser rangefinder, for some reason the battery's dead, it's not reading correctly, uh, they can be broken in a fall. They can have other problems. It, I, I did a... Uh, moose hunt in 2007 in Wyoming and Leupold had a set of laser rangefinder binoculars out. They were kind of a pre-production. They were not strictly a prototype. I think they were ready to be produced, but they had not hit the market yet. And my friend at Leupold said, hey, you want some of these laser binoculars to take on your hunt? You can you know, do a field trial for us. So I did. And interestingly enough, they were a pretty good size set. I believe they were, they were either 8x42s or 10x42s. Carried them on a chest rig like this. And what I found was uh, that, that time of the year, that high on the mountain, it was common for days to be in the teens um, and you know down close to zero at night. If those things were outside of my coat on that chest harness all day long, I found that they wouldn't read. They would range out to about 50 yards, but beyond that, you didn't get a reading. So I put them inside my coat. I thought, well, they're pretty cold. Maybe the battery's going weak was my first idea. Put them inside the coat, got them warmed up. Now all of a sudden I can read out to six or 700 yards. So I wasn't sure if it was a battery problem or whatever was going on. I just knew I had to keep them warm. So the day we got on my moose, I had them warm. I got a reading at 467 yards everything worked fine. When I got home from the hunt, I called my buddy at Leupold and I told him what was going on. And he said, oh, that, man, that's not possible. Send them back, which I intended to do anyway, because I wasn't gonna, you know, I could have bought them at a discount, but I wasn't gonna buy something that didn't perform well. When he got them back, they stuck, he said they stuck them in the freezer in the break room for two or three days, got them really cold soaked, and then pulled them out and lo and behold, they wouldn't read past about 50 yards and it was not the battery. 
apparently there was something on the, the printed circuit board in there that when it got cold, the, the sensor or the laser emitter or something got bent out of alignment and the laser pulses weren't reflecting back to it. That laser binocular never hit the market. That was in 2007. Uh, Leupold has a set of laser binoculars out now that I believe came out in 20, late 22. So they've been out about a year. They went that many years without a laser binocular because of some kind of design flaw. You know, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It can happen to any manufacturer. And I think they did just the right thing. They didn't attempt to put these things on the market once they knew there was some kind of issue. But you can go without a laser rainfinder. Suddenly, this thing doesn't work. If you're in a very foggy situation, these might not penetrate the fog. Uh, in 1988, when Yellowstone burned, my buddy Mark had a, a bighorn sheep tag, and we were up in uh, high in Wyoming for that. There were days we could not see 50 yards for the smoke. In 88, we didn't have laser rangefinders. Had an optical one, and as long as I could see a sheep and get the optics lined up, we could still get a reading, and he got a pretty good ram. But lasers can fail you. How else can we estimate the range of the animal we're after? The way we can do that is to have a reticle that has known values like minutes of angle or mil radians and know the size, the chest of an animal. A good bull elk will run from 30 to 32 inches from the top of the withers to the bottom of the brisket. And I, and I will put some illustrations in to help uh, explain this. 30 to 32 inches, let's call it 30. And that means if I can see 30 minutes of angle from top to belly, that's 100 yards away. If I see 15, it's 200 yards away. If I see seven and a half or so, it's 400 yards away. So learn to compare the size of your animal to the reticle in your scope, and that can give you a way to estimate the range when lasers fail. So that's a good backup system, is it's just program that into your head. Points in your reticle can be used for ranging an animal if you know their body size. I've already mentioned that you can use those for secondary aiming points. I saw a sheep hunt with Jim Shockey on his TV show one time, and he had been to two or three hunts in a row filming for that series. He had a loophole scope with a CDS dial just like this. In fact, I, I believe it was a VH6. The top knob was gone, and there was a big scar right across the side of the scope. He had taken a bad fall and literally knocked the CDS dial system off the top of the scope. Now he knew this was a bad situation. He did not have a backup scope with him. They were able to get it zeroed to 200 yards, but he had no way to make corrections for longer distances. And the impression I got is he didn't really, you know, I think he had a range card on the size of his uh, rifle. So he could look at 300 yards, I need this many minutes of angle, 400 yards, I need this. But he didn't know the reticle well enough to know where he had to hold for those kind of distances. So I think you need, first of all, range table taped on the side is not a bad backup system at all. But an even better system is to simply have it in your head. I mentioned in an earlier video that both my 338 and my 280 have the same trajectory out to more than 600 yards. Okay, I have memorized what I need. I zero at two. So from that 200 yard zero, at 300 yards I need two minutes of angle correction. It's actually 2.2. But that quarter minute of angle is going to mount to less than an inch difference at 300 yards. So I round to easy to remember. So at 300, I need two minutes. At 400, I need five minutes. At 500, I need seven and a half minutes. And at 600, I need 11 minutes. That's in my head. And with the, this minute of angle reticle, I know I can hold at least out to 10 extra minutes and get that at those long distances if I have to, okay? Two at three, five at four, if it's 350, split the difference, three and a half. So you can work those out for other ranges. Have that in your head and know your reticle well enough to use either mill dots or minutes of angle to hold over and range find your, your stuff. The more experience you get at working these things in your head, the more likely you are going to be able to pull off a shot when something fails you, like a laser or a, a scope dial. 
These hunts are not just walking out across the park, laying down on the ground and shooting an animal standing out there at 100 yards. You're going to be in rough country. You're going to be on horses which can fall with you or you can fall off of and equipment can get banged up. So be prepared for whatever could happen. Teddy Roosevelt had a quote that I'm probably going to botch here, but it was something to the effect that if you are prepared for anything, you generally won't have a problem. Thanks for watching my videos. If you like what I'm doing here, I'd appreciate the thumbs up, a subscription, and help keep my channel growing. Thank you. Okay, we got them both here now. You ready? Bud got one. Ginger got one. Uh-huh. Oh, she missed it. She usually gets them, doesn't she, Bud? Mm -hmm. Okay, girl. Last one. You ready? You ready? Yeah. That's all there is till next time.